When algae appear in the sea, does anyone really worry about it? This time, no one was worried. The algae didn't cause any concern. No one even paid them much attention. Until it was too late. First, Guadalupe released a warning for all its citizens. After that, the U.S. Virgin Islands declared a state of emergency, but the seaweed kept moving, and eventually it made its way to the coast of Florida. The brown mass, weighing millions of tons, stretched more than a thousand miles, and nothing could stop it. Let me grab some coffee, and we'll get started. Just an unobtrusive reminder not to forget to like the video if you forget to do it at the end of watching. First of all, it's worth saying that the seaweed we're talking about today isn't just some random clump. The Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt is the largest bloom of macroalgae in the world. It's such a massive phenomenon that it even has its own Wikipedia page. I don't have one of those. The Sargassum Belt weighs about 5.5 million tons and stretches for 5,000 miles. At least that's what some researchers think. They also think that this belt is made up of many separate patches, or drops, of seaweed. Well, if you put them all together, the seaweed would cover as much space as the American state of Delaware. In 2022, the biggest blooming ever seen was recorded. The belt grew bigger than it ever had before. However, people have known about this phenomenon for centuries. And for centuries, they have treated the Sargasso Sea, where the seaweed first appeared, with suspicion and fear. And where there's fear, superstitions always arise. The earliest records that seem to point to the Sargasso Sea appear in the writings of Avianus, an ancient Roman poet, writer, and translator who lived in the second half of the 4th century AD. Avianus, in turn, referred to the lost story of Himilco, a Carthaginian sailor from the 4th or 5th century BC. There's not much reliability here, but it all came down to the idea that this was a dangerous part of the Atlantic Ocean where seaweed would trap ships and pull them under. Christopher Columbus also encountered seaweed and described it in his expedition journals from 1492. His crew was afraid that the seaweed would sink the ship and no one would ever make it back home to Spain. To give you an idea of how frightening this place was to sailors, I'll tell you that the region was sometimes called the Devil's Triangle. Many captains went to great lengths to chart a course around the dangerous area in the seaweed. The myth was so persistent that this area got a new, just his famous name. It was coined by American writer Vincent Gaddis in 1964. The Sargasso Sea area became the Bermuda Triangle. There's been so much said and written about it, I even heard a theory about Atlantis. But it seems like part of the Bermuda Triangle legend might be explained by early sailors' fear of large masses of seaweed. Another reason is the windless conditions in that region. I suggest we still focus on algae and figure them out. Sargassum is a golden-colored seaweed that can grow to several feet long. Unlike other seaweeds like kelp, which is anchored to the shallow ocean bottom, Sargassum is suited for life in the open ocean and exists only in floating patches. And since this seaweed was literally created by nature to float with the current, that's exactly what Sargassum does, regularly traveling across the sea. It's not hard because the ocean's full of different currents that move all around the world like conveyor belts. I'd say the seaweed just needs to relax and go with the flow. But they probably don't stress out anyway. They've just been living on our planet for around 30 million years, and everything would be fine, but in recent years, sargassum has become dangerously abundant. Guess why this is happening? Of course, it's due to human activities. We come up with loads of different agricultural fertilizers that help us grow crops, but we can't keep them confined to a specific area. Fertilizers leak into rivers, then into seas and oceans, where sargassum finds them, and it begins to grow uncontrollably. In particular, the increase in the amount of sargassum is blamed on the Amazon River, because it supplies the nutrients. Dust clouds from the Sahara also played a part, along with rising temperatures and the growing nitrogen footprint of human activity. So, a mass of algae stretching 5,000 miles is menacingly creeping across the Atlantic, gradually making its way to the U.S. coastline. The algae are settling on the beaches. It's an unpleasant sight. Imagine layers of decaying sludge that smell like rotten eggs. There's a lot of sludge, and insects happily swarm to it, and even though the smell doesn't appear right away, it doesn't help much. Sargassum dies in about 48 hours on land and then starts actively releasing hydrogen sulfide. This is actually a toxic gas. The result is environmental and economic damage, frightened tourists, a wrecked local fishing industry, and huge bills for cleaning up the coast. However, this isn't the first time seaweed has invaded like this. A huge amount of sargassum first engulfed the Caribbean coast back in 2011. Witnesses of this takeover talk about enormous rafts of brown seaweed that stretch from the shore out to 500 feet. 
The beaches were covered in huge, stinky piles of seaweed, and everything was just littered with seaweed. Swimmers couldn't get into the water, and even some boats couldn't leave the port. Not only people had a bad time, nesting sea turtles couldn't lay eggs. Even though seaweed itself isn't toxic, it attracts too many insects. The scale of this algae invasion shocked everyone. But the key point is that since 2011, it's been happening every year except for 2013. Other than that, the algae always took over the shores. In 2019, Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, which also faced sargassum issues, compared the economic effects to those of a Category 1 hurricane. Just to give you an idea, these hurricanes have wind speeds of up to 94 miles per hour. For instance, earlier this August, Hurricane Debbie had similar wind speeds, and the damage from it is estimated at around $2 billion. However, the problem with massive amounts of sargassum is not only that this seaweed harms tourism, fishing, and turtles, there's another less obvious but real threat coming from piles of decaying seaweed. It's the high level of flesh-eating bacteria from the Vibrio genus hiding in the vegetation. You heard that right, flesh-eating bacteria. The species Vibrio vulnificus is especially dangerous. When it enters the body through bad seafood or just a small cut, this bacterium can cause skin infections and even lead to sepsis. And if it's someone with a weakened immune system, like someone with chronic liver disease, the bacteria can cause blisters on the skin and septic shock, possibly even death. It seems that just walking into the water with algae nearby is enough, and through a tiny injury on your skin, death will make its way into your body. In this context, the fact that hydrogen sulfide can irritate the eyes, nose, and throat and impact people with respiratory issues, such as asthma, seems almost harmless. But that's not all. Sea creatures like jellyfish can also live in the sargassum and irritate your skin, and you'd better hope you don't cut yourself while slogging through all this stinky mess, because bacteria are always ready. Besides people, nature also suffers. A dense, tangled mass of algae can smother coral reefs and mangrove forests, as well as tiny land-dwelling creatures like crabs and mollusks. Also, in large amounts, algae deprive the water of oxygen, killing fish and seagrasses, which are key habitats for many species. And you know, given all that, the U.S. got off pretty easy. The thing is, the gas produced can damage the electronics in your home since it forms sulfuric acid. In the Caribbean, people lost their electronic devices, air conditioners, and everything else, and algae were to blame for this. How about schools evacuated because of toxic gas, the unbearable stinky tap water, job losses, power outages affecting tens of thousands of people at once, dangerous health problems, even deaths. And all of this happened in the Caribbean countries because of sargassum. First and foremost, everyone who touches seaweed on the beach is in danger. For instance, municipal crews are assigned to clear Florida shores of seaweed that's washed up to make the coastline more appealing to tourists, and the workers are at considerable risk. Volunteers who collect trash on the shore are also at risk because algae stick to it. Tourists are at risk too if they touch algae or objects that have touched algae. In general, to keep yourself safe, you need to follow special precautions. Are you in a risk zone? Then you need thick gloves, disinfectants, and tongs with long handles to avoid direct exposure to the materials being cleaned. And of course, it's better not to eat seafood caught in coastal waters. In 2023, eating raw oysters at a restaurant in Texas led to the premature death of a relatively healthy 30-year-old man. He got infected with that bacterial infection caused by Vibrio vulnificus, those very bacteria from algae. And although there are no official statistics on the number of victims and deaths from this bacterium, it causes panic among people roughly at the same level of, there's a man eating shark off our coast. And with good reason. If you get infected with Vibrio vulnificus, you could actually lose a limb. Once inside the body, the bacterium gets into the flesh layer between the muscles and skin, where it releases a toxin that destroys tissue. This can lead to amputation. There have been cases before. Naturally, when it comes to seaweed that's that dangerous, efforts are made to fight it. For instance, Florida's legislature has set aside $5 million to aid local authorities in cleanup operations. The good news is that this isn't a completely new problem, and many local authorities, particularly in southern Florida, already have a handle on how to address it. They deploy entire teams with heavy machinery to deal with the sargassum. Mexico's gone even further and sent Navy ships to carry out cleanup operations in Cancun. Some areas in the Caribbean have set up floating barriers similar to those used in oil spills to keep seaweed away from the shore. Some communities bury seaweed in the sand while others collect it, rinse off the salt, and turn it into a natural fertilizer or mulch. Considering the bacteria, it's a pretty bold move. I'd even say it's a bit too bold. In Mexico, some entrepreneurs press algae into bricks and use them for constructing buildings. 
I hope there's some thermal processing involved. Someone might wonder, why not just get rid of all the sargassum? Or start pulling it out of the ocean before it becomes a problem? The answer's simple. Like everything in nature, it's a natural part of the food chain. In a way, the ocean is similar to a desert. It's huge, endless, and finding food and shelter can be tough. Drifting sargassum becomes like an oasis for passing fish and sea turtles where they can find both. Seaweed also serves as a breeding ground. Sargassum is actively used by crabs, shrimp, whales, migratory birds, and about 120 species of fish. The patches of seaweed form the only spawning grounds for European and American eels and a habitat for about 43 other endangered species. Besides, no matter how bad it gets for the beaches, people, and turtles, the seaweed actually stabilizes the shoreline, helping to form sand dunes and nourishing the plants that grow there. For these reasons, sargassum is left to decompose naturally in wild areas where the smell and bugs don't bother anyone. In short, sargassum is so vital for ocean life that it's illegal and not recommended to harvest it. It can only be gathered at the coast and disposed of. There's really no other easy way to deal with the overgrown seaweed, at least for the time being. Seaweed is invading the UK While Caribbean countries and the US are fighting against sargassum, similar problems have arisen on the other side of the Atlantic, in the UK. In 2023, over a thousand tons of seaweed were removed from beaches between Menace Bay and Broadstairs. There was so much algae that the rotting mass reached up to people's waists. Just how deep the pets would get trapped in it, one may not even comment. Actually, seaweed washed up on the shore is something that happens every year. But in 2023, there was way too much of it. The smell of rotting seaweed engulfed coastal towns, and doctors started seriously worrying about the health of locals. As always, the explanation is simple. It got too warm, and the seaweed started spreading out of control. Baby turtles approve. Remember when people were worried about the turtles that couldn't lay their eggs because of the sargassum on the shore? Well, it turns out that the huge belt of seaweed drifting in the ocean is actually the place where the baby turtles head to. I mean, after they hatch. For a long time, scientists couldn't figure this out because tracking the baby turtles was really hard. They're too tiny. So the tags and trackers would just fall off along the way. And if they didn't fall off, they'd come off as the shell grew in about two weeks. In the end, scientists started trying out different types of glue and found a special marine glue that kept the tracker on the young turtle's shell for a whole three months. That's how they discovered that turtles swim to the Sargasso Sea to hide among the seaweed, where they can stay safe from predators and eat smaller creatures that are hiding there too. Sargassum even provides warmth. The seaweed traps a bit of water and the sun helps to warm it up. So five stars for this turtle resort. Robots guarding the shore Recently, a new robot was created to deal with sargassum. If people can't handle it, why not use technology? Besides, robots don't get sick, so the machine was called Algeray, and it resembles a robotic manta ray. And the important thing is it doesn't violate any bans on harvesting or destroying seaweed in the sea, it sinks them. Before the sargassum reaches the shore, Algeray intercepts it, then dives into deep water and releases its catch there. If the seaweed ends up at a depth greater than 443 feet, it physically can't float back up. Algeray is something between Pac-Man and a vacuum cleaner? It's believed that if the robot works three months a year for 12 hours a day, it could get rid of about 80,000 tons of seaweed. These are pretty big numbers. And it's also a ridiculously fun process. You owe me a like. See you later.